Let me say good evening. Certainly, as everyone is, is finding their seats and making yourself comfortable for this evening, I'm Leonard Hamlin, Canon Missioner here at the Washington National Cathedral. And on behalf of our Bishop of the Washington Diocese, as well as our Dean of the Washington National Cathedral, I'd like to welcome everyone to this second evening here of the Long Long Way Film Festival. We are certainly glad to have you, and we have had a wonderful two days, a fruitful discussion, on yesterday evening, we had an opportunity to view Glory, and on tonight, we look forward to the movie Harriet, which you will hear more about in its context and setting it up. But as we come this evening, I'd like to take a moment just to thank our sponsors. Certainly grateful to have March on Washington Film Festival as a partner through these years, the Austin Film Festival and Baylor University. We'd like to give a special thanks, of course, to Greg Garrett, who has work closely with the Washington National Cathedral over the past few years to make this possible. And as we come, I'd like to say thank you as well to, on behalf of all of us here at the Cathedral for our programs director, Michelle Dibley, who works so hard. <laughs> who without this, this would probably would turn out completely different. So we're grateful for all of the work that she puts in. As we gather tonight, let me bring before you that as you see, the name of this festival is the Long, Long Way Film Festival. Many who come may not realize where that title comes from. But shortly before Martin Luther King passed away, he made a profound statement that when we look at this nation and race, we have certainly come from a long, long way but we have a long, long way to go. And tonight, we are hoping, and through this weekend, that we can make another step. By your being present, by your conversations, and let me say in advance, by what you take from this moment. So we're looking forward to all that will take place. As you watch the movie tonight, I just want to inform you in advance that you will see subtitling on the movie. We want to make certain that everyone, with all of the acoustics of this space, that you are able to both hear and if there is any difficulty, that you're able to read, uh, to see all that will take place within the film. But on this night, we're grateful that we have and will be led, both as moderator and this evening, by Corva Coleman. She comes to us tonight. Many of you are familiar with her voice. Uh, as a newcaster for NPR, but tonight we're grateful for her presence. And so as she comes on this evening, we're grateful that she will be leading us. But I'd like to turn it over, if we will, for just a moment. We're grateful for the partnership with uh, Baylor University, the provost, Dr. Nancy Brickhouse, who is with us on this evening. Won't you receive her? Welcome to the third annual Long Long Way film series and to this special screening and discussion of Harriet, the movie about celebrated abolitionist Harriet Tubman that was honored with two nominations at the recent Academy Awards. It's such a privilege to be with you here in our nation's capital and in this beautiful sacred space at the Washington National Cathedral. And we're so grateful to those who have been involved in making this event happen and in hosting it here. As provost of Baylor University in Waco, Texas, I bring you greetings on behalf of the Baylor administration, including our president, Linda A. Livingstone, who spoke here last year. Baylor is proud to serve as a sponsor of this film series, and we are dedicated to honoring the importance of discussions concerning racial reconciliation and justice. As a Christian research university, Baylor is committed to an academic community in which the freedoms that create a marketplace of ideas are safeguarded, and to a social community in which civil discourse and mutual respect are expected and encouraged. We believe all truth is God's truth, fully open to inquiry and debate. Discussions about challenging issues like those that have already occurred this weekend and will follow the screening of tonight's movie. 
are vital to our democracy and to creating a future that is informed by the lessons of the past, both lessons of caution and of encouragement. At Baylor, we care deeply about creating solutions to the most critical issues we face today. We know that Washington, D.C. is our nation's preeminent hub of political activity, commerce, and law, and so we are thankful to have an active, intentional presence in the D.C. area through our semester in Washington program, the many summer internships in Washington that our students participate in, and in robust programming of seminars and events that interrogate fundamental questions about how we can be a common people with a common end and a common good. We have come together here today because each of us cares deeply about seeing racial reconciliation pervade our society. And at Baylor, we believe that Christians can and must serve as agents of such reconciliation. We all deserve the opportunity to fulfill our God-given potential. We all deserve a chance to pursue our dreams. I'd like to thank the Austin, Austin Film Festival and the March on Washington Film Festival for co-sponsoring this weekend with us. And I want to thank you for coming out and being a part of these important conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkhouse. Good evening. I'm Corva Coleman from NPR News. Nice to see you. We got a good evening tonight. I am so glad you've come. Welcome to A Long, Long Way Film Series 2020. This is actually our third such uh, series. This is our third year. This event, as you already know, is co-sponsored by the Austin Film Festival, the March on Washington Film Festival, and as you know from Dr. Brickhouse, Baylor University. My thanks go to each of them for inviting me to participate in this evening, and especially here in this sacred space. We're gonna watch a film tonight, and then we're gonna have a conversation about it afterward, but I would like to introduce you to our panelists so you will know who they are. So let me begin first with the Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas of the Washington National Cathedral and Union Seminary. Kelly, will you stand? We're very excited to have Mr. Joshua Brian Campbell. He is the co-composer of the Oscar-nominated song, Stand Up, which appears at the close of our film tonight. Joshua, will you stand? So you want to make sure as you're watching the film end that you're listening, especially for the last lines of the song, if you've not heard it, okay? So as the credits are rolling, just, just listen. Dr. Greg Garrett of Baylor University is here. Greg? With me here on stage is Dr. David Taft Terry, historian and associate professor at Morgan State. Okay, so here's how our evening is going to work. I'm gonna conclude my remarks in a moment. We're then going to hear from Dr. Terry, who is going to put tonight's film into context for us. Who better to do that than a historian? Hmm? We'll enjoy the film together, and at its conclusion, uh, after the song, we will take a quick five-minute stretch break, which I always think is best, and then we'll come back together. The five of us will return here to the dais for the moderated conversation and talk about what we've just seen, okay? Okay, I'd now like to welcome Dr. David Taft Terry to the microphone, and then we'll see the film. David? So, good evening, and let me add my thanks to you all for coming out. Um, my job here is to be very brief and give you just a frame, a quick frame to uh, take in this film with. 
And to do so, I want to use a term that I often use when my students, when we talk about uh, this time period in American history, and that term is conspiracy, right? Uh, from the very beginning of the slavery experience here in the United States, there was a concerted, ongoing conspiracy. This film picks up at its crescendo sometime in the middle 1800s. The victims of this conspiracy, the enslaved themselves, from the first generations in the early 17th century to the very end of slavery at the middle of the 19th century, were co-conspirators bred, uh, bred in bondage and committed to slavery's destruction. The urgency that we see in this film is a reflection of the acceleration of urgency around the time period that the Harriet film is concerned with. So you will be dropped into this conspiracy, you'll be dropped into the tension of an ongoing urgency. And the chief propellant of this urgency is the domestic slave trade. You've all heard of it, and many of us here in this country, in this part of the country, have personal family experiences with it. But there was a, a boogeyman, if you will. He was known by lots of names, slave trader, uh, speculator, some called him, quote unquote, the Georgia man. If you're familiar with Harriet Tubman's texts, she refers to the Georgia man. There were people coming to snatch away your loved ones, to snatch away your babies, to snatch away your mother. This is the urgency that we see. This is the central part of the tension that uh, this film is concerned with. What is also important, I think, about this film is it is also uh, representative of where we are now, both in filmmaking as well as in academia, of finding ways to center the perspectives, historical and otherwise, of women, and in this instance, African-American women. Um, we can talk more about it in the, uh, the uh, discussion afterwards, but if you are familiar with the way in which, for example, Rosa Parks has been reinterpreted, you'll see a lot of that in this film. There's a great gravity to the, to the contributions that Tubman is making to this time and this place at the center of her film. And if you haven't seen it before, I'm sure you will enjoy it. But that's all I have to say for you. Please welcome Harriet, and we'll talk afterwards. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Again, I'm Cora Coleman from NPR News. I'd like to begin this part of our evening by reintroducing our panel. Immediately uh, to my right, your left, is Dr. David Taft Terry of Morgan State University. Seated next to him is the Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas, Cathedral Canon Theologian. Mr. Joshua Brian Campbell, the artist, thespian, and co-composer of the Oscar-nominated song, Stand Up. And Dr. Greg Garrett of Baylor University. Welcome to the panel. So we'll start the moderated uh, conversation portion of our evening, and I'm going to hand the mic over to David. And David, I'd like to start with you. I, you began our evening by placing Harriet the film in context for us. Now that we've seen it together, can you tell us more about portions of Harriet Tubman's life that were highlighted in this film? Sure. Sure. So uh, this was really concentrated, as you probably gathered, in the 1840s. Uh, Tubman makes her escape in 1848. Um, the, the tension that I teased at the beginning was all around the notion of the tightening of restrictions uh, around the phenomena of slaves escaping um, out of Maryland or north of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, Tubman senses this. Tubman is impacted as, is, as are most uh, enslaved African Americans in this part of the country, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky. The tobacco economy had collapsed. The cotton economy of Alabama and Mississippi was really growing. So a domestic slave trade, a trade of individuals from the upper south states where we are to the deep south states had really become voracious. Uh, by one scholar's estimates, between 1820 and 1860, a million black people disappeared to the south. So quite literally everyone knew someone 
who was being stolen away as, as Tubman and her family feared. So this is the motivating engine about around the uh, crisis, around the urgency. Uh, Tubman herself is uh, caught up in this, makes her flight, and then her story picks up from there through the end of the destruction of slavery. Um, as I was saying to some folks uh, in the interim, uh, I hope this is just a beginning for most of you in your exploration of Tubman because her life before was amazing and her life afterward was as spectacular. So uh, I'll leave it there and we can pick up some more. Well, I do have a follow-up question. Sure. When you and I first spoke about tonight's feature, you encouraged me to recall that in addition to what we've learned tonight, it's also a film. It helps bring Harriet Tubman out of the shadows. It helps yeah. make yeah. her known to us, but it is also partially fictionalized. Mm -hmm. yeah. What caution might you have for us? Again, I don't want to take any way, thing away from a wonderful film, but, but it was a film, and I would, I would drive you to a lot of the wonderful scholarship that has emerged in the last 20 years. Um, we can talk about, and I guess we will, why some of the fictional elements were added, uh, the bigger character, the the... The, the African American. The bigger, who, long, the slave yeah, catcher. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. The slave catcher. Um, not only do we know very little about the broadest family's pursuit of Harriet, uh, but we certainly don't know. I mean, sure, were there black people who were participating in slave catching? Sure, but someone as outsized and as prominent as him, I, I've never come across anything like that. I was talking about this with members of my yeah. family, and um, my daughter, who's also a historian, was mm -hmm. very wary yeah. of looking at Bigger Long, going, yeah. there is no way yeah. that Bigger Long would be seated on a horse sure. next to Gideon as yeah. if they were equals. And, and certainly not so much that a, a, a stereotype, if you will, that the movie sort of trade in can be. So again, one of the things that maybe we will talk about is how this movie, in, what this movie is intended to engage. And certainly uh, on both sides of the Mason and Dixon line, north and south, there were blacks and whites working together to destroy slavery. And perhaps in an effort to remove racial antagonism without necessarily removing the, the conflicts of slavery, his character was added. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but... It, it, He's not real. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Let's jump to Joshua. Joshua, the, the role of music is central to this film. Would you talk to us uh, about how you came to work with the star of tonight's film, Cynthia Erivo, in composing the closing song, Stand Up? Um, sure. <clears throat> it's a long story. Um, but I'll, to segue into it, I'll respond to what you were saying about sort of the historical, I guess, accuracy of the film. I, I said earlier on a panel that I'm really sort of obsessed with the beauty of quotidian black life. And on the one hand, I, there are some questionable, I think, elements to how the story is modified. On the other hand, um, and Casey Lemmers, the director and screenwriter, has talked about this a little bit. I kind of see some of the moments of, you know, storytelling, like the, the, stu the truth of the story, right, as um, what I think Sadia Hartman calls is critical fabulation, like inserting into it what we don't know about the interior of black life. And a lot of that is musical. A lot of that is, you know, accompaniment. And I think that um, Mr. Terrence Blanchard, had, he set me up with a beautiful, beautiful score. Um, I came to the project because he heard some other work that I had done um, and sort of tipped off the Harriet team to my existence. <laughs> um, which is always and, a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we, I got together with a friend of mine, Gabe Fox Peck, who ended up co-producing the final versions you hear. And we, we demoed something. Um, we came together with Cynthia and with uh, her producer, Will Wells, um, and eventually ended up with the song that you hear at the end. That was the short version. I'm told that we could possibly persuade you to sing for us a little bit later. Will you consent? Well, that's what, well, that's what I'm told, too. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. No, I mean, later. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Later's good. <laughs> Joshua, how has black gospel music influenced you? And what historical messages are, are you working to communicate in, in your compositions and in your work? 
I don't even know whether influence is the word um, someone asked me earlier about. I can't remember what the question was. But the answer was that like this, like traditions of black gospel, black folk, black American music are not like existing in some cryogenic state. They just are. Um, I just am a product of black gospel music more than I am influenced by it, right? Like it just was. Um, I grew up singing it. Um, I was raised in a church, well, I was born in a church, my cousin will tell you, and then we jumped across the street to another church where I was raised. And um, I just grew up singing. They taught us spirituals, and in in, in I grew up singing in choirs and directing choirs. And um, the messages I, I, that I think come through in what I write and compose is, is they're not even so... Um, concrete as much as they are. This project was, I was fortunate because it came right out of my wheelhouse sonically, you know, the, 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 the story that I was, you know, put on the spot to tell. But in everything I write, it's just, it's a sense, it's a feeling um, that, yeah, I'm, I'm finding hard to describe now, which I think kind of gets at what it is. Kelly, the role of the black church in tonight's film is absolutely front and center. And we're very quickly introduced to it by Reverend Samuel Green, of whom we get a very false idea purposefully until we see his true work revealed. Can you tell us more about the role of black ministers and their ministries to people who were enslaved. Yes, thank you for that. I think, indeed, Reverend Green is a snapshot of the really rich complexity of the black faith tradition, particularly as it was born out of the cauldron of slavery. So when we are first introduced to him, we see him preaching as a uh, the other character, the enslaved character, said this testimony of obedience. And as Harriet said, right? But what we have to recognize is that as he is preaching that to the enslaved people, all around him are white people watching. And so indeed, he, in the light of day, while the white master and all of the overseers and are watching, he preaches the religion of the slave owner. That is, and you see the people taking it in. But were they really? They weren't. When they are on their own, back in the hush hollers, as we would say, or in the enslaved quarters, that's where they experience God and where they meet their Jesus. And so we, what we see, and as I talked about earlier, that uh, they are informed by a, they did not come here not knowing God. They are informed by their own African religious heritage and their experience of God uh, in the, uh, while they are an enslaved people and they discover the God of the Exodus, and they discover the Jesus that is not written on the side of slave ships. And that is what they, that's the faith that they nurture. And so what we see, Reverend, and that's the faith that tells them that they were never born to be enslaved, and God never created any enslaved. And Reverend Green holds that faith, but he can't hold it publicly. Right, and so that's that's what we see, and 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 we see it as it comes through in the testimony of of the music, of the spirituals. It's always this double coded message, hidden in plain sight, uh, and that's that's the black faith tradition that was born uh, out of the hush harbors of slavery. It's interesting over the last couple of nights. I I mean I read about slavery, I know about slavery, but you know, there's something about having it just put in your face, Greg, that is just 
really hard. Um, and, and this one really actually in a lot of ways was easier to watch than last night's film, Glory, which had a lot of explosions and gunfire and violence, um, and you know, a lot of violence here, although it did happen, much of it was implied or discussed, but not, but not shown. So when we talk about Glory last night, Glory was written by white screenwriters and was intended to bring a story to life about valiant African-American soldiers during the Civil War. It was released 30 years ago. This film, 2019, was written by two African-American screenwriters, Casey Lemon and Gregory Allen Howard. Um, I'd like to ask you, A, to reflect on this, and then also, because I always ask you this question, who is this film intended for? But reflect on the larger point, please. This, we have had the Your mic's on. Is this on? No. no. Uh, th we've had the great pleasure the last three years now on our Saturday night film of, of showing a contemporary film and, you know, putting it in conversation with the earlier film, uh, which, you know, they had tended to be made by well-meaning white screenwriters and directors. And uh, so on the one hand, we could say that this is the, I'm not going to say final phase, but it's the most advanced phase of what we see from Hollywood filmmaking because we've got uh, people of color telling their own stories, acting uh, in their own stories as the central figures in their own stories, and that is an amazing thing. Um, but the other really interesting thing is that in this sort of most recent phase where we've shown films by Jordan Peele and, and Spike Lee and, and tonight by Casey, these are also really thoughtful, skilled filmmakers who are using the conventions of Hollywood to engage people in different kinds of film genres. So we've, we've had horror, we had uh, this sort of uh, history, uh, black, ex black exploitation, um, you know, detective story last year. And, and this year we've got this really interesting hybrid of the biopic, uh, because we've got the story of the, the, the great person. And a big part of this story is how did Harriet Tubman become Harriet Tubman? But being Harriet Tubman, her story is a story that is marked with all of these elements of action and tension. And so many of the reviewers uh, talking about this film talked about it as an action film. In fact, um, one of your colleagues at NPR, his uh, review about it uh, spoke to it in terms of action. And Casey herself called it a superhero film. So one of the things that we've got going on here is we are using maybe the predominant dramatic mode in Hollywood film at this moment to engage all sorts of people in stories about what heroism looks like. And so you have this person who has you know, the incredible moral courage and faith and um, the ability to sort of project some force to, to exert her will, which is a story that we're told an awful lot in Hollywood. Um, and now it's being reclaimed by black filmmakers. Black Panther, one of the most popular films of all time, engaged audiences of every kind. And tonight we are engaged not just with a great hero uh, who was a woman of color, but a hero who can engage all of us in her story because of the amazing things that she accomplished. David, did you want to follow up? And I, I think that's absolutely correct. But I would also say that one of the things that they did get right, one of the things that the lead actress did get right was the fierceness that was Harriet Tubman. And had they wanted to take, and this may speak to the notion of audience or at least uh, what was to be communicated to audience, um, Harriet, from the records that we have, she, she could and would scrap. Right? So the scene from Philadelphia, for example, when the news of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act and there's sort of anarchy and everybody's in the streets. I don't know that that is anywhere in her record, but it did remind me of a similar scene and a similar time to take place in Boston. Uh, you have to understand that uh, before the Civil War, the military battle, there was civil violence in the streets throughout the northern and in some places even southern port cities over this issue of slavery. and. Uh, uh, Harriet recalls being in Boston in the early 1850s when a black man named Anthony Burns, who is a fugitive, is arrested, and his friends, including her, try to keep the slave catchers from taking him. And she describes very uh, vividly 
fighting with the men and falling, tumbling down the stairs, scrapping with these dudes. So the notion of, of Harriet um, um, as a fighter is real. So the idea then becomes uh, the, the, the message, I think, that sort of comes through 150 years later from some of the genre of the slave narratives that were meant to create this idea of enslaved blacks as somehow deserving of freedom, though within parameters of sort of Christian respectability. So some of that we're still trying to unpack and, and, and allow these characters to be exactly who they were and not be judged one way or another for it. So. Greg, I want to follow up on, on something. Um, and that's the concept of agency. Um, film critics often talk about the Bechdel test in films. And if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, named for artist Alison Bechdel. And she has these three ridiculously simple rules to judge how women are depicted in films. And for a, a film to pass the Bechdel test, really, it must have one, at least two female characters. Two, these female characters must have names. And three, they must converse with each other about something other than a man. That is the Bechdel test. Um, this film does that, Greg, and more. Does that signify a change? Well, it, it is a significant change, it, and it doesn't mean that it, this tidal wave has passed over and we'll never see films like that where we don't have women uh, with agency. And the other thing that I would sort of add in here that we haven't talked about yet, but we talk about every year, uh, is the, the white savior trope. Uh, oftentimes, well-meaning filmmakers in Hollywood will want to deal with uh, race and prejudice in as responsible way as they can, but they end up inserting um, a, a white person, usually a white man, who ends up being the person who makes things possible for everyone else. And, and one of the really wonderful things about this film is not only does it pass the Bechdel test with flying colors, but these, well, actually both of our films this week, uh, because Matthew Broderick is really not the agent of change. Uh, Morgan Freeman is much more of the agent of change for the characters around him in the film last night. Um, and so we have got films in which people are allowed to claim their agency and affect each other because we believe that community matters and that we shape each other and encourage each other and challenge each other. Um, but here they do that without the sort of heavy-handed um, power structure stepping in in some way uh, to, to make things right. And that's a great observation. Kelly, Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 14, I had to reach way back into my childhood for this. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. There is a lot more in the rest of that Bible verse, but I felt that I was almost struck by lightning when I saw that these were Harriet Tubman's last words. I go to prepare a place for you. Can you reflect on that? Yes, thanks. Because I think uh, about that and I think about, I wanna connect sort of that question to get this other conversation about Harriet Tubman, superhero or shero, et cetera. That it is easy for us to call these people like Harriet Tubman a shero or a superwoman. Because when we do that, we exempt ourselves from the responsibility of doing the hard work to prepare a place for others. And that place is a place where everyone can live and breathe free and grow fully into whomever it is their God has created them to be. 
And so I am reluctant to talk about a Harriet Tubman as this superhero or Morgan Freeman's character yesterday or, or, or Shaw for that matter. Because these were people who were driven from not only something deep inside that, that moral, had a moral compass that knew whether, even though they may not have gotten it all right, but they knew what was not right. And these are just ordinary people desiring not simply a freedom for themselves, but for others. So I'll end by saying this when you say, what does it mean to me? And people say, I've gone to see, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, and so I'll be very brief, but my, I knew my great grandmother who was born into slavery. And she died uh, when I was maybe around six or seven years old. She lived to be about 100. And when I think of my great-grandmother, who obviously lived to see freedom, I think of those who didn't live to see freedom, who were born into slavery, died in slavery, never, ever, ever breathed a free breath, didn't never dreamed that they would breathe a free breath. Yet they fought for freedom anyhow. And they fought for freedom that they knew would be, but that they would never experience. They fought for the freedom of us who sit on this stage today, blessed with ebony grace. That's what it means to go to prepare a place for you. We are accountable to those who have come before, and we are accountable to those who will come after, and we are guided by the freedom that we know is the justice of God. That's what that was about. I'm going to come back to David in a minute, but I need to jump to Joshua. Joshua, the, the songs we hear in tonight's film serve two purposes. Negro spirituals are stunningly beautiful and they are lovingly conveyed in this film. But as Kelly mentioned, Negro spirituals are also code. So for example, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming for to Carry Me Home. Swing Low actually means go low into slave-holding states. Sweet Chariot is the Underground Railroad. Coming for to carry me home is take me to a free state or Canada. And we see this in the film when Harriet goes to bid her mother farewell. I'm sorry, I have to leave you. I have to go, but she sings to her mother the double, the nuanced language, the code is there. Tell me about how that worked into your song, Stand Up. Yeah. Um, You've got the, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As you were explaining the code, I was almost like, don't tell anybody, because it's, <laughs> it's so, um, no, it's so ingrained into like the black tradition that I came from, like that I've never even heard it explained, but like you kind of just know in an inchoate sort of way, like this is, these are the messages that are being brought forth with this music. Um, and it also plays with themes of sort of trickery and signification, right? Um, and you know, I guess I knew it would be sort of on the nose, but I thought, well, w we have to put her last words at the end of the song. I mean, um, I, didn't, I didn't know when I wrote the song that was gonna be the last words you saw like in the little script that was on the screen, but um, I just knew that I had to be there. Um, and to speak to the earlier question, 
she says, I go to prepare a place for you, which is, yeah, I think the sort of beautiful danger of the Shiro trope um, ends up being that universalizing where it's great for everybody to identify with the themes of like, you know, being an organizer and being someone who fights for freedom. But it then becomes easy to lose sight of the ethic that Harriet Tubman had where she was concerned with freeing black slaves and taking them from enslavement to freedom with or, with or without you know, the collaboration or the assist from white people. That was gonna be her objective, no matter, that was gonna be her ethic no matter what. Um, and she says, I go to prepare a place for you. It's so remarkable that, it's both remarkable and makes the most sense in the world to me that she would align herself with the words of Jesus Christ, right? Like a black woman um, s s speaking in the voice of Christ, right? And I, I, when, I, when I hear it, um, if I could be so bold, I think like a womanist analytic would teach me that when she says that, she's not only saying I go, but I have already been preparing. I've been baking your pies. I've been rearing your children. Um, I've been working your fields. I have been doing all of that, and I have been freeing my people, right? Um, so, yeah, Harriet Tubman is a prophet, um, and I, I, I had to cap off the song um, with her prophetic words, because she said it better than any lyricist could have said it. David, did you have something you wanted to follow up with? Uh, I would also, so again, the, this, this film is just a, a slither of her life, right? Was Harry Tubman died in 1913. So between, between her uh, uh, work with uh, fugitive slaves and, and during the Civil War, you know, she opened a home for the elderly. She opened a home for black uh, Civil War vets. In, in fact, she married one. She died as Harriet Tubman Davis because her husband had been a Civil War vet. And at the end of her life, she was working, you know, bridging the eras and the epochs of the black struggle. She's working with Ida B. Wells. She's working with Mary Church Terrell and the black suffragette movement and the women's uh, club movement. You know, they are, as, they, as, as that effort to now combat Jim Crow is coming into the early 20th centuries, they're pulling her to their, to their meetings as Mother Harriet to draw strength from her struggle. So, you know, she's, she's preparing a lot of places for lots of, of, of elements of the struggle. So. I want to ask Greg one more question, and then I'm going to ask Joshua if he'll sing for us. So. I want to ask you again about the concept, Greg, of redemption, emancipation and redemption. Can you reflect on that for me? This is a film that makes me think a lot about liberation. And um, some years ago, I had a chance to work on a contemporary language Bible translation. And uh, we got in lots of trouble with conservative Christians because um, we made the decision to translate Jesus's title um, as liberating king. Uh, some people think that Jesus has a last name. He doesn't have a last name or a middle initial. But the whole, the whole idea of, about what Jesus came to do is to, to liberate. And when he, when he initiates his ministry, uh, he stands up and he reads from the scroll. And uh, it's, it's a scroll that talks about um, liberation of all sorts for the infirm and, and for the poor and for those struggling in debt uh, and for all those people who are on the margins of the culture. And he rolls up the scroll and he hands it back to them and he says, this is what I came to do. And so that idea of liberation, uh, we, we greet tonight this powerful agent of liberation um, because it's not, it's not just about liberating you from this degrading state in which you find yourself, but liberating you for your full humanity and, and the recognition of that full humanity. And uh, so what it makes me think about, um, early in the film, she says, you know, God showed me what to do, but I did the walking. God showed me what to do, but I did the walking. 
And there's this wonderful uh, prayer from the Jewish reform tradition, which goes something like this, pray as though everything depends on God and act as though everything depends on you. And, and that's the nexus of liberation right there. Joshua, will you consent to sing for us? Sure. Um, if, I could, if I could take a liberty just to say before I sing, um, Harriet Tubman at the end of her life was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Um, and a part of the beautiful testimony of me being a part of this project is that I was raised in an AME Zion Church in Sherrill, South Carolina, not in Auburn, New York, where she ended her life. Um, and our denomination remains the custodian of her home site. And I was on my way to a pilgrimage, or I was about to leave for a pilgrimage to her home site when I got the call. They were like, yeah, we want to use this song in the movie. Um, so I got to thank her uh, on the ground where she ended her life. So um, I'll sing a piece of a spiritual, and then I'll sing a freedom song that they first taught me in that small AME Zion church in Sherrill, South Carolina. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal To stay here, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me, and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my and go home to my Lord and be free. No more dying. No more dying. No more dying over me. And before I'll be a slave. To my Lord and be free. Thank you. Our time is concluded. I want to thank my panel tonight here on stage with me. Dr. David Taft, Terry, thank you. <laughs> Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas. <laughs> Mr. Joshua Brian Campbell. Dr. Greg Garrett. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for giving us your attention. And I deeply hope this evening and this conversation will resonate for you for a very long time. It is a privilege for me to be asked to share this evening with you and be part of this weekend experience with a long, long way, and I want to thank everyone who asked me to participate. I want to remind you, um, we'll be here next year, so I hope you will be too. 
So come back again in a year. And to close us out, I'm going to ask Kelly to offer a closing thought, and then I'll bid you all farewell. Kelly? Well, let us go forward with a word of prayer. As Rachel weeped for her children and would not be consoled until they were free. As Harriet would not give up until her people were free. May we not be consoled. May we not give up until the legacy, which is the conspiracy of slavery, is no more. Let us go forth in freedom. Amen. Thank you. Good night.